So here's some words from Jesus, from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, beginning with, or, or in chapter 23, beginning with the first verse. Then Jesus said to the, to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in marketplaces and have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call one anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is the Word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you pray with me, friends? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. As we've heard your scriptures read, now as they are proclaimed. We pray that you will work through me and around me, in spite of me, have whatever it takes so that it's your word that's proclaimed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've shared the story before of two brothers who were in my first appointment as a pastor who sat at separate sides of the church. There was something that had happened in their lives. I don't know what it was. It was none of my business. But they were constantly uh, at war with each other, and they reached a point where they said, we will just not talk anymore. And one sat on this side, and one sat on that side. The only time they saw each other was at church on a Sunday morning. I wonder what it was. What was it that caused that relationship to fracture in such a way that they, they wouldn't even acknowledge each other if their, that their paths would cross? What was it that, that made them reach that point where they said, no more? It, it, it may have started with something small that was added on to over time so that more and more of those little things added up. Could have been a great big thing. Could have been something humongous, something that, that would drive a, a, a sharp wedge through their relationship. I don't know what it was. But I saw the, the results of what it was. A relationship ruined, families divided, and unable to coexist with each other. When we come into Scripture, especially into the conflicts between the followers of Jesus and those who were followers of, of, of you know, the, the Jewish customs and traditions, it seems like sometimes we're coming into the conversation, into the, the conflict it, that's already been long and ongoing uh, before we even knew uh, about them at all. Uh, constantly, it seems that Jesus is having these difficult arguments and conversations with these people called uh, Pharisees, and then later Sadducees, and teachers of the law, and, and scribes. And it's easy for us, as people who are, are Christians, 
to only see Jesus' side of it. Why couldn't these people just get it? Why was it so difficult for them to embrace the teachings of Jesus? And part of it is that we don't know all of the backstory. We're coming into the story in the middle, and, and it has been long before we experience it. The Pharisees were not priests. They were, were lay people. Lay people who, who had a passion for God's law, but weren't priests but wanted to live their lives in such a way that God would be pleased by their righteous living. Problems became that over time, in an effort to outdo each other in righteousness, they began to burden one another and themselves with, with laws. Scripture says to obey the Sabbath, to keep it holy and to do no work and to rest. Well, by the time the Pharisees got through with it, it was more work to keep the Sabbath than it was to follow the Sabbath. They had added rule upon rule upon rule of how to do it the, the right way so that God would be glorified and so that they would have that good feeling of accomplishment themselves. And to be able to sit in judgment of those who didn't follow the laws as precisely as they did. And so when Jesus steps into the picture, he sees their righteousness. He sees the, the, the things they are doing. But Jesus also knows the heart. And he knows why they are doing the things. That it's become less and less about pleasing God and more and more about pleasing others and making oneself so important in the way that they observe the law. Jesus loved the Pharisees. We often don't think of it that way. We often see them as opponents of Jesus, as enemies of Jesus. Jesus loved them. Jesus saw the burden that they bore upon themselves and the burden that they shared with others. At one point, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden with the burdens of the law. Come to me, and I'll give you rest. When I hear those words, I think of Jesus speaking to the crowds. Come to me. Don't listen to them, but... What if Jesus is saying, Pharisees, come to me, all you, you're weary, you're heavy laden with burdens, you Pharisees, come to me. I'll give you the rest that you seek, that you need. I'll teach you how to obey the law with righteousness and with mercy and justice and grace, not this rule following. And adding rules upon rules, burdens upon burdens. No, put that aside. I'll show you the right way. I'll show you how to live as one who pleases God with your daily living. We come into it late in the story. Even to this day, even to this day, there are situations where we come into a story and we don't know exactly how the causes were or what was going on. And our human nature wants us to help others to, to be happier. That's just who we are. We, we love to make other people happy. But we also know that we can get tied up in our own uh, tribalism, that, that my way is right and your way is wrong, but if you just do it my way, you would be right too. There's a conflict going on right now 
in Israel and Palestine and, and that region of the world that's been on fire for millennia, millennia. And, and who knows who started what? Who knows when it began? Who knows if you asked each side to list the atrocities of the other, they would each have a list that would roll out like a, a paper or a scroll down the hall, down the steps, and out the door. Each of them. And, and sometimes we, as, as human beings, we see that and we just don't understand. And, and, and we want to fix it. We want to, I want to fix that. But I guarantee you that if we have 40 people in here, we have 40 different opinions on how we could solve that problem. Now multiply that and, and to six billion people. You got six billion people uh, on this earth who would have a solution to that problem. But it's so complex, so deep that we, we, we can only do so much. And, and it's frustrating, isn't it? I, I want to see peace in that land. How can I make that happen? How can I be a, a, a part of that, to, to, to make that, the peace of Christ grow in that land, rather than conflict and division and war? It's helpful to think, why are they so angry? Why is this side so angry at this side? Um, for the Palestinian people, think of it this way. They had that land. They lived there. And, and, and had generations grow in that land. And then the United Nations came in and said, we've got to make some room for a safe place for the, our, our Jewish brothers and sisters. They've been abused and beaten, persecuted, murdered. We're going to give them a safe space, and we're going to use this land. Think of it this way. If the United Nations came to Beaver County and said, you know, Beaver County, we know you have roots here, we know you've, you've built towns, you've settled down, you've made yourself a nice little place here, but the Seneca Indians had it first, and they need a place to live, and so all of you, you know, either get out or, or learn how to speak Seneca, because they're going to have this land now. That's the emotion that they feel. They feel like somebody came in and took their land without even asking their opinion on it. And for the, our Israelite brothers and sisters, the Jewish people, what they've gone through for their entire existence is overwhelming. Murdered, slaughtered, kicked out of neighborhoods, forced to live in, in uh, ghettos, never being welcomed as, as people into a, a land where they, they, they come to live. How do we even begin to, to, to solve those conflicts? How do we begin to do that? Well, I, I, I am stubbornly convinced that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. And, and, and if you remember last week, we had those, the, the clothesline, the, the, the love of God and the love of neighbor. And if we do that, if we love God and love our neighbor, that maybe we won't solve the complex problems of the world, but we'll spread a little bit of peace in our own lives, in our own region. Maybe Manaka, maybe Beaver County will begin to look like a place that others turn to and say, wow, they really love each other. They have their differences. They vote for different parties. They, they, they go to different churches, they, they do different things, but yet they love each other so much. And I want to know why. And, and it can start with doing things the way that Jesus said to do them. So I'll give you a for instance. You know, those little conflicts that, that may not mean anything, but, add, but, but become a war. Last Saturday, I raked leaves in my yard. And, and I had a friend, uh, the, the, one of the trustees from, from Aliquippa Church, helped me, brought his truck. 
and we, we picked up bad, uh, tarps full of leaves, we threw them all in the back of his truck, to two, two trips. And, and, and the yard looked beautiful. Got all the leaves out of there, the little area where I was, you know, I worked all summer on. Yeah, it, it, it's beautiful. Beautiful. And then Tuesday, I heard a sound coming from my yard. It sounded something like this. And I looked out into my, my beautiful yard, and I saw my neighbor's work, uh, uh, crew that he has mowed his yard all year with their blowers, blowing all my neighbor's leaves into my yard. <laughs> I tell you, I wanted to go out there and shake my fist. <laughs> I told I looked to Kristen, I said, you believe this? <laughs> that could have started something. Who knows? That, that if, I, if I would have given into my human temptations to go and give my neighbor a piece of my mind over blowing those leaves into my yard, what might have started? Out of that conflict, how would, would that have built into other conflicts and other conflicts until by the end we would have forgotten what we even started the fighting about? But, but Jesus gives us another way uh, to seek the peace in the community. And, and while I am not happy about leaves in my yard, I, I have. A blower myself. And I have a ring. Now I know what you're thinking. Blow them back into the neighbor's yard. <laughs> but I have a tarp. <laughs> and I, if, you, if you drive past my yard, you'll see a cart in my yard. And I'm going to blow the leaves on the tarp. I'm going to throw them into the, the cart. And, and they'll be gone. And my, my neighbor and I will still coexist in peace. In, in that, that, that little neighborhood of Aliquippa. But, man, that could have turned into something. Just that little, one little thing. It's leaves. Who cares in the big grand scheme of things? Just leaves. But how that could have blown up. And, and I'm convinced that the, the, the biggest conflicts that we see in the world, even one as big as the, the Israel conflict, was just started by something small that never got forgiven to the point where they for everybody who was involved in that conflict is dead and all of their just all of their relatives are dead but the conflict still goes on i am convinced that jesus teaches us a better way to live where peace and justice and righteousness reign and the squabbles are put in the past even so Come, Lord Jesus. God loves you, and so do I. Let's pray. God, as we come into our time of communion, uh, we are the thankful people. You have given us the opportunity to be your secret agents, agents of peace in this troubled world. That, that every drop of kindness that we pour into the world does make a difference. It, it does change the world. It does reveal your grace in our lives. We pray for, for this community to be transformed by your love. For this entire county to be one that, that, that people look to and say, there, they, they've got it. They know. They know Jesus. They live like Jesus. The world's different because of them. In the meantime, we confess to you, we fall short of that. We fall short of, of, of living in such a way that your glory shines through us. We don't love our neighbors as we should. We don't hear the cry of the needy as we should. Just forgive us, we pray and free us from those burdens of shame and of guilt so that we might be worthy first worthy of your name 
to be called Christians. And second, so that we might be worthy to receive the gifts of the bread and the juice that are available for us for communion today. We pray your peace overflow from us and your grace overwhelm us. In Jesus' name, amen.